We had a little dust up with Bree this week, for which I don't know if you'll uh, take any joy in the fact that she's been ratioed pretty hard on the segment that inspired this. So I went back and looked at the original interview from last year because I wanted to see because a lot of claims were being made in the rising appearance that you had this week. Um, and a lot was forgotten. For example, she actually said she didn't question your integrity. She said that she said that up top. That seems to have changed, frankly. Um, she said the Twitter files were newsworthy. She said she absolutely would have worked on the Twitter files if she had the opportunity. You mentioned that you because she she I think continues to build a case around maybe you were given selective files. You at one point talked about how you were given the entire Slack channel of certain executives where every message was in there. Um, and you also said you were given an entire laptop that wasn't vetted by a lawyer. But the main point that you made was, hey, okay, so I have limited time. You didn't say it quite this way, but you basically said I'm dealing with a flaky billionaire. And I don't know what he's going to do day to day. So I need to move quick. And so I looked at the FBI messages and what was there was there because I thought, well, that's the that's the most likely to bear fruit. Now, throughout the interview, very famously, she, she didn't really like that answer. And she kept trying to find some kind of bias, even though right here and she seems to have forgotten this. She admitted what she would have done and that it would have reflected her own bias. So let's take a look at that. So for me, I also wouldn't be prioritizing. If I'm going to be fully honest, my first search words would be Bernie, <laughs> you know, uh, socialism, you know, Bernie. Bro I would like go through all of my Twitter people who I know have claimed to be shadow banned and blocked and had their accounts taken down over the years. You know, and I would I would go through, I would look for a request for Hillary Clinton and, and some of the Podesta file disclosures about what journalists they thought were friendly and all this kind of stuff. And that's what I would be searching for, because that's my priority. I'm not saying it's the most important thing in the world. I'm not saying it's more important than what you've been searching about in terms of FBI interference. It probably is not. So I, I acknowledge that I accept that I have no problem with that. But. It needs to be, I think, foregrounded. That this is not a comprehensive search, that I'm not looking through everything, that I don't have the ability to look through it because, frankly, I'm being limited, not necessarily nefariously. I'm not saying it's because of Elon Musk, like, you know. I don't know that I'm being limited. But you just told I, us that I, you're I, being I, limited, that you feel like you can't ultimately make make an unlimited number of search requests. I'm being judicious about, about what I ask for. Let's put it that way. But, but why? Because you feel like there's only so many requests that you can make? Maybe you never know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. This. This is. I don't own the company. I. Don't, I don't control this situation. So were you? Were you told that this is very expensive and difficult to do these requests? So don't. This isn't a no. bonanza. This isn't a free for all. No, but you. But I've been doing this job for a long time, and I, and I know that things change with sources, and 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 you never know what the what the situation is going to be tomorrow. You have to act as quickly as you can to get the story that you can uh, as fast as you can. All right. Now that seems clear enough. What, what part of this do you think Brianna seems to still not understand? I, I don't know why this conversation is still happening. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think she uh, was under some kind of misconception about maybe the process. Um, I mean, even just a couple of days ago, I saw her tweeting something to the effect of, uh, you know, somebody with the Twitter file should. Oh, we're we're going to get to that. Yeah. Yeah. Access to. Um, and, you know, in the moment, uh, there were all sorts of things. If I had a list of things that I could have examined uh, and carte blanche to do it forever, I, I of course, would have gotten to it. Uh, there was a lot of stuff, for instance, that, you know, that I, I guessed was probably being done more at the algorithmic level, like the Palestinian stuff um, at that time. Now it's probably being done right. more actively at, at a higher right. level. Um, but that would have been a whole new set of searches. The process for me was we we got those laptops, we got the to look at some slacks and we saw some names and some entries and some acronyms 
that we immediately knew were meaningful. And we kind of huddled up. As soon, and by the way, as soon as I saw FBI, DHS, and ODNI, the first thing I said to everybody is this thing is temporary. Like it's not going to go, like, right. it's going to get shut down somewhere. Right? right. So let's, let's get as much as we can. And we just focused on the stuff that we already had leads on. Um, and I, I understand the frustration of like, I would have liked to have found out what happened with Bernie, but it was also frustrating that, you know, we'll, we'll get to the show, I guess the, the, the later show, but that interview was very frustrating to me because I felt like she, I felt like she was trying to get me to, um, admit that I was doing something unethical or that the, the right. situation was unethical or, uh, that there was something wrong with what we were doing when, uh, the reality was it was just a very unique, odd, uh, you know, set of circumstances where the only thing you can do is the best you can. Right. And, and we, we came up with a process and, and, and did it. Uh, and hopefully, you know, I, I think it had some impact, but, um, but she just wasn't happy with it for whatever reason. And, I, and I, to this day, I don't really understand. She's still angry about it, uh, which I, well, I don't well, really the, well, the, she's. I mean, at this point, this is becoming her white whale. Um, I mean, it's just I mean, I personally would have liked uh, for you to have searched for how Wendy's decides what <laughs> menu items go on the two for six dollar <laughs> month. Because some months they they do it a fantastic. You got the spicy chicken sandwiches there. You got the double hamburgers. But then other months it's like a glorified like one dollar menu. You know, <laughs> there's probably something about so, that you know, in there. There's probably something in. I there. would like to see you focus on that more if if it's not you know too much trouble. But it is, but that's just me. That's my subjective bias showing. Is isn't this kind of where all of this comes together? Because it seems like this is a conflict between a partisan commentator's idea of journalism and a journalist's idea of journalism, which she essentially concedes. She says if she had been set loose on that, presumably you could answer this better. She never would have found what you found about this entire network of censorship, uh, NGOs, supposed NGOs that are actually acting as cutouts for the government because she would right. have been busy going down the rabbit hole of how it affected her personal political project and biases, which she admits right there. That's why I don't know why she's still talking about this. Well, she was referencing a time, and Matt, you mentioned this in the interview. This was a time when the left posed no threats well, we'll get, we'll to get anybody to gotta, because Bernie had that. folded. Like, if you were to do a search now, yeah. right, would you search ADL? Would you, know, <laughs> would you search APAC? Because they are the ones behind a lot of the censorship now. I imagine you would. you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would. Absolutely. Um, we, we worked kind of in another way, though. I mean, like the, the only time we started off with a topic was the first time. That was the Hunter Biden thing. Right. That was a specific story, right? That was a specific story. And we did that because it was a known instance of censorship. And I thought we might find something. And we didn't, obviously, because it was being vetted by former FBI general counsel. And that was a, you know, it was interesting, but it was it was not great. Right. Uh, but then when we got the sort of big pile of random stuff that we didn't understand, um, you know, that that's when you start making all the logistical calculations like, okay, am I going to do searches for other things in the hope of finding it? Or am I going to drill down into what looks like an interesting exchange, but I don't really understand what it is yet. And I, I picked the second course uh, and that we, you know, that's when we found out what the election integrity partnership was. And we didn't know where it was run out of or who was doing it or how the bureaucracy worked. But we had some kind of general idea that there was this bureaucracy that was making recommendations about election related posts. Right. And I thought, you know, OK, this is day two of the thing. Um, this is already interesting. We're seeing the FBI mentioned in conjunction with that uh, in connection with that. Let's just let's just go for that. Let's lean into that and see and find out as much as we can about that. Um, 
And and that's also where you know she's she's talking about where you told you couldn't look into it. Um, you know, I already had a pretty good idea at that point that Elon was flaky, as you say, right? Uh, yeah. And he he was impetuous, and you know, he had a history of making sudden decisions, including by the uh, way, when the Twitter you were, files. <laughs> right? When you were on our show, you said you thought he had multiple personality disorder. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, it was like a after, different person every day. Yeah, after after that book came out, yeah, I thought, well, that makes sense. But you know, with all those pre- uh, those things that were, you know, pressures, um, you know, I was just thinking we have to come out of here with something, uh, or else this is going to be a massive failure. And you know, so I wasn't even thinking about specific issues at that point. I just wanted to come out with something that we could report, uh, and. And, you know, it's two different ways of looking at the world. I understand what she's thinking. Um, but, you know, uh, maybe if you'd done it the other way, you might have come out with nothing at all. Right. And right. what's the value of that? You know. All right. So let's uh, let's take a look at th- this clip. A lot of people have probably seen this is when this really comes to a head about left censorship that's not being turned up in your searches and the question of whether you're being given selective information like when when i see you know con- conservative sites talking about this yeah sometimes it's like you know, the fbi is doing this and that and the other but oftentimes it's there's this far ranging right anti right wing bias da, 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 which i don't have a problem with except for i think that the story is there is a an establishment bias against more fringe populist parts that include yes the right but also the left that's i mean it's it's a nuanced point but i think that it's important but the, the the reason you're seeing more of this against the right than the left is that the left is toothless and no threat to anybody, whereas the right um, is actually scary to the national security establishment because of Brexit, because of Trump, and because of other things. If that's true, Matt, why is it that 85% of all FBI uh, action, you know, F- FBI activity has been historically focused on the left? I'm not talking about the, the right now contemporary. Yes. Okay, well, I'm not looking at 1970. I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at 2015 well, on. That's fine, but but Matt, we all saw. I mean, we just all saw Bernie wins Nevada, and next day on MSNBC, it's Bernie's in talks with Putin, and he's going to cut people's heads off in Central Park. I'd I mean, love to get that story. I would I would love to get. But is that on Twitter? I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I've certainly looked for it. Um, well, what, tell, tell me. Okay. All right. So. Do you think that's on Twitter? Like, do do you at this point, do you feel you were given selective information? Do you feel if you were able to poke around more unlimited pull on every thread? Do you think you'd find that? I, I don't. My my guess is that they. They probably they, they may have called a few things, but uh, it seemed like. Whenever I, I had a suspicion that some kind of search return was light, it felt like they were taking out privileged information about the company that um, they might be sued over. Uh, okay. And, you know, but I didn't have any proof of that. Um, there was there was one instance, I remember, where there was an attachment that was missing from an email, uh, but it was about something kind of inconsequential. So, you know, at least in the email, it looked like. Uh, but I don't think so. I mean, the turnover times were, were really fast. And uh, I think from what I, I gathered from their whole response, they were happy with what we were doing uh, generally. Um, I, I just, I, I don't really think that, that they were trying to push us in one direction or another. And by, and by the way, I did find stuff about censorship of the left, right? Um, it wasn't so much about the United States, but uh, I, did, I did look for it uh, in all the materials that we had. And I looked and I found censorship of Democrats in 2020 um, and made sure to publish examples of that. Uh, but it, you know, even, now that, even, that was what consortium news and and the well the news guard story is more recent, right? Yeah, the news guard story is more recent. But you know, even in the, in the Twitter files, you know, one of the first ones we did, like there were there was an example where there was some 
woman with a low follower account uh, in Arizona who made some kind of joke about um, Republicans on election day or something like that. And you know, it was taken down after a recommendation by EIP and she was a Democrat. And I, you know, I called her up. She was a, um, if I remember correctly, she was a PhD or there was a PhD in her title. Uh, but I, I was looking for Democrats uh, because I wanted to make the point that this was not all happening in one direction. Right. Um, and they, they couldn't have, they couldn't have done it in such a way that we only saw censorship of the right because so much of what we got were these gigantic spreadsheets full of names where they would have had to painstakingly go through and, and take things out. Um, and even do searches to find out who those people were. So it would have taken forever to do that. I, I just, I just don't think they did a lot of that. Okay. All right. So, uh, here you, uh, went on rising to address some claims that Brianna made about you having withheld, um, information about Elon and your dealings with Elon, which you took serious exception to. Um, now we've been very curious cause I don't think I, 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 you'll take offense if I say, cause you said it on our show because Mehdi Hassan kind of rolled you. Right. But this was a yeah, very different Matt Taibbi. This was like the end of the Rocky three montage, Matt Taibbi. So did you run up some steps before <laughs> this interview? Like how? That's funny. I just did that with my kids like, a couple of last week, uh, in Philadelphia. <laughs> in Philadelphia? Uh, yeah, 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 we took a trip to Philadelphia, but not. Well, there you go. That answers the question. That's it. Yeah, you exactly. did do it. That is really funny, actually. <laughs> um, All right, let's. But take no, I mean, in, in in the in the case of Medi, uh, he just got me. I like I wasn't prepared. Or what you know, there were there were things that I didn't know about, so I didn't know how to answer. Um, and here, I, you know, I I did know. Yeah, but I had a better I, I, idea of what was coming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look. It's not. And I think what would be clarifying is to have some insight into what you meant by decline to criticize you. Because that that seems to me to be where the bulk of the. No, that seems to be what is. you want to talk about. But let's just be clear. I'll, I'll, I'll be done with this in, in 18 seconds. OK, just to be clear, you made factual mistakes about. When I when I re revealed that I was being censored, uh, you uh, made a mistake in saying that I haven't criti I, I still haven't criticized them. I haven't criticized them over the last year. Uh, you, you made a mistake in saying the Twitter file searches were not done. You you made a mistake in saying that there was one cache. I don't know where you got that from. It you was said a, it was a mistake, baby. Not, I, I have no interest in denying that. But but I would okay, like well, to talk that's, about that that's a little bit though more. because when I'm you came online, there's, there's, there's more. Okay. Uh, you, 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 Look, well, go, go ahead. Go, we, we, I mean, we had you on because we wanted to make sure we get to all of yeah, this. I would have, I would have been happy with a correction, but, 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 but since you're not going to do that, um, you know, okay. The other, the other two were you. All right, I, I'm really okay, trying not on. to play to the drama here, but yeah. you know, there's a little more of this. I don't know how you keep it cool, man. Like, like, okay, so all of the smears, I'm not interested in litigating that. And, right. and you're I'm kind of being you. silly and overly confrontational to insist on defending your reputation against my uninformed smears, which I'm conceding are uninformed smears, but you're being ridiculous to spend time on them. I mean, it, 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 it's a clever strategy. It'll probably, it, it seemed like it didn't work with her viewers, but no, it did not. Um, no, I mean, I, it's insulting. I, the, if they were inconsequential mistakes, I probably wouldn't have said anything. But for instance, the idea that, um, you know, she said that, you know, it was my understanding that, that the Twitter file searches were already done, that they were, there was only one cache. Now, the implication of that is that I was withholding criticism of Elon Musk right. over a story I wasn't even getting at that point. Right. Uh, and, you know, that led into this other comment she made about maybe there was something else that was going on. Um, and, you know, I, I had to make the point that no, right until the very end, I was waiting for results. And, right. and you know, I would have I done anything to get more of them. Um, 
but you know she she sort of waved that off as if it's inconsequential same thing with the whole idea of you know not telling people about the censorship uh you know as if that's a minor mistake that's that's a big mistake that's if, if i had held that it would have been a big deal and and i didn't i you know i, I and by the way, that's a fine line too. Like you don't like to to go after your sources, but I kind of had to in that situation. So um, right. it was very right. frustrating. And and the, the, and I, I've run into some other journalists who who seem to be a little bit cavalier about the whole idea of making errors and how it's not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand where that comes from. Um, you know, I. I it, before I did a story, and to this day, you know, you you lie awake at night before you 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 publish it, and you you worry because the, like the worst thing you can do is screw up and, and give somebody like Mehdi Hassan an opportunity right. to to kill you right. on the air, right. Right. Uh, in addition to hurting somebody, you know, which can happen. Uh, well, so I don't understand that. Um, all right, let's take a look at the rest of it. We're saying that uh, essentially that I that I had done searches only for one side and not the other. Well, I Matt, actually let's did, talk about I that. Didn't, I, you didn't, ex- you ex- I didn't say you had done searches for one side or the other. I said I had you on my show and you got very pr- bristly with me at that time as well. I wish we could have these conversations without them turning into these weird personal vendettas. I think we'd have a lot more productivity in the space if we did. Let's not have but any wait a personal vendettas. When- yeah, let, so, so let me stab you. Don't get a Band-Aid. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that that's that's how I hear that. Like, how dare you defend yourself against these smears? And you've written about this, how journalists used to be terrified to get something wrong. It could be the end of your career. And again, I'm seeing the difference between somebody who makes a living offering opinions and somebody who is an actual journalist. Yeah, or or was re- it was trained as one, right? I mean, and you know, like that sequence, um, I w- I should have been better prepared for that because she said that she didn't say uh, the thing that I claimed, and if I had the quote there, I could have told, I could have read it out to her. I mean, she she did say that you know, if it were me, I would do a word search that's broader than just search terms that are associated with attacks on the right, um, and so. You know this. That that's another thing that I that I had never seen before, which is this whole um, let's answer an accusation uh, of an error with another error. Uh, it's it's hard to contend with that in the moment, right? You have to really be uh, difficult about it. Right. Um, but you know uh, that's that's uh, part of the thing, the whole ball game now, and. Um, you know, I, I, again, I don't understand it. Like the the the, the downside is sm- feels to me s- to be small when you say to your audience, you know, I got some things wrong uh, right. in this last piece, um, and I'm sorry. I apologize to X, and uh, and then it's over, and your audience then trusts you to be right every time going forward. Um, but you know. It's fighting to the end. And, and, and there's an implication that, you know, whose side you're on and, and where you fall on the political issue is more important than that. Um, and maybe to modern audiences it is. I don't know. I, it, it's just different. I, I, I don't think it is because if it were, people like Rogan, uh, who have more heterodox kinds of opinions, wouldn't be the most popular podcast that wouldn't be the most popular podcast if that's what people really wanted i think part of his success is that they find it a relief from right. that monoculture so not content to let it go he uh responded to somebody here who under elon under elon your twitter files were under dorsey under elon said twitter there's free palestine free gaza account Twitter shadow banned me and took 10,000 followers away from me during the course of a week. And it was probably more than that because I was gaining followers as Twitter took them away. Brianna says someone with access to Twitter files should really look into this. I'm just stunned by the level of ignorance that that reflects because, you know, I'm not a I'm not a journalist. I'm, I'm an opinionator. 
the problem with this formulation is very obvious to me. Right, I, I don't have the stuff. I yeah, but, well, I mean, clearly you're being implied given the timing. How would you get this? Like, why right. would what? How would the, how does this reflect on you? I I, I don't know, and and uh, I, I saw that, and, and I actually had a hard time for for a good minute or so trying to figure out what the point was. Um, but I think you know, sort of vaguely, it's just. I was in league with Elon Musk on some level, and therefore I bear responsibility for this somehow, or all of us do. And um, so, gotcha. I, I guess I don't know. I, I tried to explain to her that you know that relationship between you know with with sources, it's like it's politically neutral. Like I, I you know, I don't. Yes, he's giving me information, but that doesn't mean that I approve of everything that he he says. But anyway, it was weird. Well, I, was, I mean, I think yeah, the big yeah. difference Kate, Kate, between Kate's got an interesting take on this. Well, yeah, because I mean, like, I think the difference between Brianna and someone like a Joe Rogan is that she, first of all, has a law background. Lawyers get paid to win and never give up the case, never oh, abandon true. the point of view that you get paid to represent. And also, you know, she worked on those Bernie campaigns. So, you know, she was really in the trenches. And I think she's very competitive. And I think she feels very compelled to advocate her side. And I think, you know, that's a different background than the one that you come out of. I also think that very competitive streak probably um, blinds her to the fact at the time. And again, this is a lot less true now post October 7th, but 2023 was this kind of weird time to be on the left. I mean, she thinks of herself as on the left. She is on the left. I think of myself as on the left. And, you know, the first 10 months of that year were this kind of strange time where you, don't, you didn't really know what it meant to be on the left. And I think October 7th really kind of brought that into very clear view for me. It reminded me of why I'm on the left, because it was left activists who were in the streets protesting for a ceasefire. And so being on the left really meant something post October 7th, whereas that year before, again, you couldn't really see where the left was. Go I mean, the left was most obsessed with, you know, unisex gender neutral bathrooms than they were anything that actually threatened power. And I think coming out of a Bernie Sanders campaign where you really felt like you were in it to win it, going into this post Bernie world where not only uh, is there no left momentum anywhere i mean they couldn't even pass paid family leave through the through the uh, house um or not not through the house sorry through the senate um you know then it became this thing where not only does the left have no power but because the left has no power they're arguing over these very niche sort of boutique sort of cultural issues they're not they're not relevant enough to be censored and i think she had a very hard time just accepting that and i think partly that's because she has a law background. You get paid to stick with an argument, you know, and just double and triple down no matter what. And B, she was in the campaign. So I think, you know, when you're in the campaign and you're battling every day, that becomes a big part of how you operate moving forward. So that's that's why I, that's how I think of it. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes sense. Also, you know, Elon Musk is probably the, you know, exhibit A of what Bernie is against. Right. Uh, you know, he's his whole campaign was built around billionaires and with spotty labor records. Uh, <laughs> and this idea of um, taking information from somebody like that or even being civil to somebody like that, uh, even even in a utilitarian way, which is exactly what our that relationship was. Um, she she felt like there was something wrong with it. Yeah, but um, isn't, isn't that a funny exception for somebody who works for The Hill, which fired Katie Halper for oh, taking well, a stand that she fully endorses to take? Well, yes. Um, I, sh uh, I thought about bringing that up, but, but um, didn't want to do that. I mean, look, it, it's... Uh, I, I like Bree. I mean, we, we, we got, we've always gotten along prior to the Twitter files and, and that was the reason 
you know, I was super paranoid during the Twitter files, um, especially in that first month. And that was one of the reasons why I agreed to do that bad faith interview is because I, you know, I liked her and I, I didn't think it was going to turn into something that was going to be very difficult to navigate. Um, not that I, you expect softballs, but you know, most of the time, you know, we're, like a reporter knows that there are going to be certain things you can't really talk about. Uh, and, you know, you do the interview around that, you find other challenging questions to ask, but there are you know, certain things you can't say. Um, but she just seemed very personally offended by the whole thing. And I, uh, I, I think that was true of a lot of people on the left. Like, like for instance, she asked, um, what about the Twitter files was important to the left? And I went, and she, and what she meant by that was like specific people who had been censored, but really the whole concept should have been important to the left. Right? Of course, of course. Uh, censorship and, is by definition important to the left. Yeah. Right. I mean, and it would have been, you know, not that long ago. So uh, I just, I thought that was odd. The whole thing was odd. Well, if it's any comfort um, now, this is not selective. This is your hard press to find a positive response on that tweet this is from post duopolis what's with your hate boner for matt taibbi when you see the world as top versus bottom instead of left versus right and understand we are ruled by an oligarchy duopoly complaining about not defending the left enough seems silly and moot this is from kevin westbrook you should investigate x to find out what's going on the access that people had originally was cut off matt taibbi is shadow banned on this platform Red pilled leftist says what Keaton always says, just take the L and move on. And uh, finally, Andy, cringe double dip here, Bree. You should actually be apologizing to Matt Taibbi. So I hope that's some that's some comfort after that dust up. I know you don't like those kinds of situations. Some people feed on it, but you're uh, you're pretty, pretty mellow, non-confrontational guy from what I've seen. Yeah, that's I, actually going to be on my headstone. Took the L, moved on. <laughs> when I go, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, my, I had a book once of last words, which was like the funniest book I ever had. I, I always think of Oscar Wilde, which was apparent. Apparently, his last words were either "this wallpaper goes" or "I do." <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's amazing. So. I think, is it Jack Benny's tombstone that says, I'll be right back? Or is that Johnny Carson? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, it's one of those. <laughs> right, yeah. um, all right. So, so, so to wrap up on a positive note and also to show people, okay, so uh, as I said earlier, you know, Matt has a beat. Every reporter cannot be everything to everyone and cover every subject opinionators kind of do that. That's what we do. We look at the news of the day and we try to cover a broad spread. I was actually talking to somebody about this the other night. I said, yeah, I mean, I almost couldn't really be a journalist and do what we do because that's a discipline. You've got to spend time going into records and going into dusty courthouse. I can't be looking at the day's headlines and being ready to offer an opinion about it and do that at the same time. It's too completely different things. So right. uh, just to show you, this is what Matt has been doing. He has gone around to the liberals to try to preach the evangel of what he has found in the Twitter files. And he's rather relentless about it, both in his writing and in his pursuits. This was uh, the Montauk club, very famous. Now it's a public space, but it used to be uh, one of these 19th century men's totally. clubs in Brooklyn. And um, I, I had the opportunity to go out there and uh, see Matt at work. So this is my own footage. CISA, CISA, if you don't know, is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. They're going to be one of the stars of this presentation, unfortunately. It's a division of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, they'd be, they were very intimately involved with, with, well, a number of different programs that we'll get to. But, um, but that's the reality, and, and this is something that I always try to bring up, especially with you know sort of independent-minded or democratic-minded audiences, because this is the same kind of you know corporate versus independent dichotomy that was a huge issue in the financial services story that I covered, where 
big banks get bailed out, they get to do whatever they want, and small regional banks got you know paid the piper in the, after 2008. It's the same thing with this issue. All right, so there, there you are in Brooklyn, and I remember you build this as going into the heart of the kind of liberal consensus, come at me. And actually, yeah. other than the guy who starts screaming insanely. Who's the performance artist. Yeah, the performance artist in the back. Other than that, people were very open to what you were saying. You're going there to the left, which, you know, at core are your people. I think like many people who feel politically homeless, they say, well, you know, I mean, 10 minutes ago, I was considered a leftist. Right, right, yeah. No, and, and uh I mean, it was really cool to that. That was a really cool talk. And by the way, thank you for coming out. That was awesome. Thank you. It was great. Um, and, you know, I was very, I was actually very heartened after that because, it, you know, there were, there were lots of people who were interested and it, and it felt, um, you know, like there, there were people who still cared about the issue. My, my sense is that people do uh still care about this issue it's just that it's kind of assiduously kept off certain kinds of media and uh, attacked um you know in places like the washington post or 60 minutes or nbc or whatever it is uh and but i don't i don't think ordinary people really think like that i mean um, right i don't know what do you think but my, my, my guess is no right like most people don't like the idea of censorship i don't think uh, I, so I, that's what I was trying to put. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a very small subsection of overly online and overly uh, corporate media imbibing people. The problem is the reason they have such power in the discourse, they vote. They vote. Right. They vote in disproportionately great numbers there. I had, I had somebody the other day talking about you know, what was wrong with the Trump people. And he described himself as a politics junkie. I said, you're not a politics junkie. You're a corporate news junkie. That's not the same thing. <laughs> That's not the same thing. But right. these corporate right. news junkies, they vote, man. They, they're, that, that's it. That's their heroin. You know, I mean, Hunter, sure. you mentioned Hunter Thompson. He wrote a little bit about that, how for a lot of people, politics is like a drug. It's like a drug addiction. He, I mean, he, yeah, he talked about that. He, he had given up drugs and went into politics. He, he like he needed politics and big fires in his life. Right. Uh, <laughs> I remember that. That was really funny. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think for a lot of people, uh, getting that dopamine hit of, you know, turning on MSNBC and getting that rush of I hate this, I hate that. Uh, it, it is a thing, um, but it, and it's difficult to penetrate. So um, you're right. But also, there's also another problem, which is that the people who go into government and work in Congress and work at big academic institutions, the pro censorship folks are massively overrepresented right. in those right. places. Right. And that's that's kind of the problem. Right. All right. Is Matt? it hard if I ask one oh, very oh, yeah. brief Sorry. thing b before we wrap? Yeah, because yeah, I think I think uh, the Jimmy Dore show audience would be very interested in this because you when you le i remember when you left the useful idiots podcast you said it was to work on a book and the subject of the book as i recall was going to be about covid and the upward transfer of wealth during covid how corporations basically looted the country under the pretext of a public health uh response and then obviously we know that the uh Twitter files project kind of fell in your lap. And so obviously that book I'm assuming was back burner for that reason. Do you have any plans to write that now that uh, that project is gone? No, I, um, I, I did start it and, uh, you know, I, I did do some traveling about it. Oddly enough today, I, uh, on my site, there's an interview with this guy, Leslie Apold, uh, who wrote a book, Wall Street's War on Workers, where he's talking about well, one of the well, things. Yeah, you're you're presenting that as kind of the antidote to what was the lib book that they were all a oh, titter white about? Oh, White World Rage. The white World uh, Rage, it's, right. it, it's really like the racist shitheads out there, uh, but the, the title they settled on was White, right. white Rural Rage. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that I, the, the first chapter of that book was going to be about the use of CARES Act money to to uh, uh, spending that on stock buybacks, which led to layoffs. Um, 
and so I, I maybe at some point I'll make some features out of it. Um, but no, I know I, I probably won't be able to do that book. As you say, it, it just I, I have to maintain a site now too, and that's a lot of work. It's it's, it's tough to write a book like that and and do you know man, create content uh, at any kind sure. of rate. So, but that that is a very rich topic, and I hope somebody does do it because there was an awful lot of stealing going on. Well, send it to me. I'll publish it under my name. I'll give you half. <laughs> send, send me what you got. I'll finish it, and we'll work something out. Okay. We'll, we'll we'll talk numbers. I, I, yeah. Excellent. And you actually you actually reminded me. So so briefly, there's another question the Jimmy Dore audience would love, and thank you for being so generous with your time, Matt. Um, you said at the event in Brooklyn that there are seven people in the media that everyone knows are CIA cutouts and everyone basically knows who they are. And you said when you see a headline, you know, it was one of the seven when one of them wrote it. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I don't want to get myself sued. So, um, you know, I, I have to be, I have to talk around this a little bit. Uh, but um, what was it you were saying about Nicole Wallace? Not what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I don't want to get sued, but yeah, Joe her. Scarborough. Uh, but here's what I would recommend for, for folks, um, you know, as as a tool for reading the news, when you see um, new information that is leaked uh, anonymously uh, that, and that is attributed up top to anonymous sources. Um, uh, and then somewhere further down in the article, there is an on the record quote from a CIA uh, official or let's just say a DIA official, um, something like that. Like an intel if there's an intelligence official who's, who's quoted on the record somewhere, but then the people who are actually giving the information are anonymous up top and uh, consistently over and over again. Things like leaks of signals intelligence, uh, you know, that are broken in a newspaper, which, by the way, is illegal. They're not allowed to do that. It's like one of the few things that you can't do legally. Even journalists can't do that. Um, when you see over and over again that they're going to the same reporters, uh, you, you know, you should take note of that. Um, you know, those relationships are interesting. You know, maybe they take different forms, but uh there there are a couple of names if you ask glenn greenwald about this he'll he's in brazil he doesn't care about getting sued yeah he'll, he'll say the same thing there's a few um and each one of the big intelligence uh officials kind of has their own favorite reporters and it's not that hard to figure out who they are so um i think that's the easiest way i i, I can put that the Times, the Washington Post, and a couple of other organizations have uh, a couple of those folks on their staffs, and you know you could just say that they're well sourced. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to put it. All right, Matt, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we so we much, we always promise you like uh, twenty minutes and go two hours. No, it's uh, all right. I, I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. you and where can people find you, you? Uh At racket.news. Uh, I got my own neon now. Isn't that I, I saw that. I saw that. Major upgrade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, racket.news on Substack and, uh, you know, America This Week, which is also on the same site uh, with Walter Kern. And thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. All right. Good luck, Russ. Hey, there's still tickets available in Stockholm, Oslo, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, Cortland, New York, Oakmont, Pennsylvania, El Paso, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, Edmonton, Alberta, Vancouver, British Columbia, Denver, Ashland, Virginia, and Athens, Georgia. See you there. Mm -hmm.